There we go. Hey, everybody. This is Julian David, product expert here at Townsend Labs. Welcome to this very special live Q&A with the Grammy winner, Cassidy Turbin. I'm super stoked about this. Uh, the production that we just uh, had the pleasure of listening to was uh, actually a, a session that was tracked at his LA studio, uh, Willowcrest Recorders, and uh, with the uh, Sphere L22, of course, on the trumpet, for those of you who didn't catch that, but it was pretty obvious. Um, so yeah, welcome to this live Q&A here today, um, September 20th, live on YouTube. Um, I'm, I'm super excited about today. We have lots of great stuff to talk about. Cassidy is already waiting on Skype for us to get through a couple of, uh, of announcements. Uh, there's, so I, I already mentioned that there's actually going to be two announcements today. Um, one of them, I'm afraid I'm going to have to keep until the end because it's so exciting and I want you guys to keep watching. Um, but it's, we'll, we'll get to it and it's going to be worth the wait for sure. But there's one other announcement that I want to make right away. And this one actually came in, um, I think it was last night. Um, Chris sent me an email because uh, and some of you guys have actually probably received this in your inboxes as well via email. Um, the tech nominees were announced and believe it or not, we are once again nominated for a tech award for Sphere 1.4. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's really awesome. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we already won a tech award in the microphone category uh, last year for... Um, or oh, actually, sorry, at the at the beginning of this year, at you know NAM 2020, um, for Sphere um, uh, 1.3 AAX DSP, um, which of course was really exciting for us and and just a great um, yeah I don't know a great testament of how well uh, Sphere is being received out there. And shortly after Sphere 1.3 last year, we also released Sphere 1.4, which um, for those of you who may remember added 10 extremely awesome new microphone models to the collection, which brought the whole count up to 30 microphone models. And um, so by the time we received the tech award, we were already one version ahead on Sphere 1.4. Um, and now here's the tech nominee uh, or the tech nomination for Sphere 1.4 for next year. And um, I'm going to just switch to Firefox here and uh, go through that. As we scroll down here, this list, there's computer audio hardware, DJ production technology, headphones, large microphone, nah, 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 microphone preamplifiers, microphones, recording. Very cool. And let's just zoom in here a little bit. So first of all, fantastic companies, fantastic products in this list. Uh, big fans of AA. Um, the R88A is a fantastic stereo microphone, stereo ribbon. Um, guys at uh, AKG, Austrian Audio, Earthworks Audio, um, Josephson Engineering, also a California company, great guys over there, the C705. Um, um, United Studio Technologies, I actually haven't heard of them, but I'm sure it's cool. Um, sounds a bit like a 47 FET clone there. Um, not sure if, if anybody out there has ever used this one, but um, yeah, probably a cool mic to, worth checking out. And then, of course, <laughs> there is the Townsend Labs L22 uh, version 1.4. So um, we're going to get into that a lot more in the weeks to come. Um, the uh, voting period, I believe, actually has not started yet. Um, but you guys will be hearing from us about that. And, um, you know, last year we did a, a giveaway um, related to that. I don't know. Maybe we'll do something like that again. Uh, this is all so fresh that uh, we actually haven't discussed any of this. So... Um, we're gonna, we're going to do something special for um, the tech uh, voting period, um, and uh, yeah, of course, this is once again uh, a good opportunity for you folks out there to show support for Townsend Labs and for Sphere. And you know, we're just we're just honored and it's excited to actually be among the list of nominees. Um, I mean, there's some some really cool stuff here, and uh, I see Chris is on uh, the chat right now. So hopefully, you folks out there in the chat right now can give him a big shout out. Um, because, you know, he, he's the brains in the company and uh, has, has put all of this together. And um, it's just it's just amazing kind of where we've gone with this technology. It's, it's really, really exciting. Um, but I don't want to be rambling about that too much. Um, so, uh, you know, we're going to get into the Q&A here pretty quickly. Um, one thing I do want to address here real quick um, before we start talking with Cassidy is... Uh, you know, I, I understand, and this is also, I think, true for, for Chris and Eric, for sure, um, that a lot of you folks out there are waiting for mics. Um, there's a pretty long list right now of people who are waiting for mics to be delivered and shipped to them. 
And uh, so first of all, we're really sorry about that. And secondly, we are working on getting as many mics out there as possible. And there are more mics coming very soon. So um, yeah, please, please be patient with us. Please be with us. And there are more mics coming. There's been an increasingly high demand for the mic, which is awesome. Um, but of course, we want to get those mics out to you folks. Um, one thing I will say is it's going to be absolutely worth the wait. Um, I can't talk about it, but there is great stuff coming and it, it, you guys will be blown away by it, I'm sure. So um, hang tight, be patient. And uh, you, if you guys have placed your orders, you're in the queue, your distributors are the best people to talk to, or your dealers, um, the, the people that you've ordered from are the best uh, people to talk to when it comes to when the actual delivery is going to be and where you guys are in the queue. So uh, yeah, hopefully you guys can be a little bit more patient with us, but there are mics coming out and, and going out um, to, to you folks. And uh, yeah, hopefully it won't be much longer. So let me have a quick look at the chat here. Um, Mark Pixley, these mics are essential during lockdown. Well, I'm uh, very excited to hear that. Uh, we actually have seen uh, quite a few people, um, you know, working with Sphere remotely and, um, and, and making use of the technology in that sense where, you know, uh, somebody might be tracking with the Sphere L22 and then somebody else is tuning in um, remotely and actually controlling their settings and then sending over the raw tracks for, for mixing and for further processing. You know, kind of the things that we imagine that this technology would help us uh, or allow us to do. And uh, so I think in these kind of special circumstances, it's, it's particularly awesome to see that people are actually using this technology to that extent and that it's helping, you know, folks record remotely and that kind of thing. Um, Let's see. Uh, oh, Cadence Kid is on the on the uh, on the stream as well, which is uh, of course uh, Cassidy's brother. Hello from Sweden, Matthias. Yeah, shout outs back to you. Um, Big Kish here. Uh, beautiful horn tone. That was in regards to the uh, 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 Joel Schnaper uh, Gold video. Um, thank you. We're going to ask Cassidy in just a moment about what that um, what mic model he used for Joel. I'm sure. Uh, let's see. Randall Nielsen couldn't happen to a better company and group of folks. Congrats. Yeah, thanks. We're, we're really excited about this tech award and hopefully all you guys will support us in the, in the voting process. Um, so with that all said, like I said, I don't want to be rambling too much. Uh, we're going to give a super warm and excited welcome to Cassidy Turbin. <laughs> hey, Cassidy, what's Hi. happening? How are you doing? Very well, thanks. Awesome. It's so good to see you. Uh, you know, when you we, too. when we, the last time we saw each other was in person uh, before uh, before NAM, uh, just just a day or a couple of days before NAM, when yeah. we uh, shot the videos with you. And uh, yeah, how how times have changed since then. I know. But um, yeah, it's it's great to be together with you again. It's great to have you on this live Q and A. Uh, you know, we've received lots of great comments on the videos that we've released so far. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, so, you know, we have about 40 viewers right now. I'm sure there's going to be a couple more joining in in a little bit. Um, so to all of you guys out there, um, guys and gals, you know, don't, don't be a stranger. Feel free to comment. Feel free to ask questions. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the queue, um, but there's definitely room for you folks to submit your own and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I always learn a lot in these Q&As. So, you know, for me, it's always nice because I can kind of take my own little questions and weave them in. But um, we definitely <laughs> want to talk about uh, all, the, all the stuff that's coming in from, from other folks out there. Um, why don't we, you know, I, I, I think probably a lot of people will have seen um, the, uh, the feature video with you, the interview that we did, The Magic of Recording. Um, I'm assuming a lot of folks will also have seen the Spell of Love walkthrough video. If you guys have not seen that, definitely check that out after the, the Q&A um, in, our, in our YouTube channel. But, um, you know, maybe just give a quick summary of, of the, the many different hats that you wear in the recording process, because I know that you kind of have a closet full of hats that you, that you wear. So, you know, give us a, a, a quick breakdown of that, if you would. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I have a studio here. And so... One of the hats is owning a studio and running a studio. And most of the time that is me engineering here. Mm -hmm. uh, but occasionally people do come and are engineers themselves or they're a producer and an engineer. And so they use my space. And so one of my hats 
uh, when I'm not engineering here is also making sure that all of my equipment works, yeah. uh, instru- instruments, um, and uh, that I've got water for people and <laughs> coffee and stuff like that. But for the most part, uh, being an audio engineer here is the main hat I wear. Yeah. And um, a lot of the sessions I work on, I'm, I'm somehow involved as a musician as well, mostly drums. Mm-hmm. Um, and so musician, engineer and production, uh, those three things are the hats I wear and sometimes all of them at once. Yeah. So that means that there are times when basically you record yourself playing instruments and then there are times when you, um, you're just a session musician essentially, right? So you kind of know both, both sides of the glass, if you will. Definitely. Yeah. I have, I have, uh, a handful of people who come here who are very good engineers and they're also producers and they will come to my studio and I'll be in the other room yeah. and play drums right? and they'll, they'll record me. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I, yeah, both sides of the glass. I like to say that cause yeah. Yeah, for sure. that's how studi- studios are with that glass window. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. Cool. And then, um, you know, I think another another thing we can talk about maybe just real quick to, to get everybody up to speed. So, um, you know, you, you've, you're a five-time Grammy winner, and those Grammys were for engineering uh, the artist Beck uh, on the album's uh, Colors and Morning Phase, which I, I both love. They're just fantastic-sounding records. Um, Great. And uh, how did how did that how did that happen? I, you know, it's in the the interview feature that we did with you, but there was actually a lot more to to tell about that. So maybe we can kind of pick up a couple of those storylines and talk about that a little bit in more more detail. Um, sure. How, how did yeah. you get involved with the back? Uh, when I was in my early twenties, uh, I basically got asked if I wanted to work at his home studio, mm-hmm. and uh, at that point, I had done quite a bit of recording, but never in, never, never in pro tools. I had done logic a whole lot. So I came around and there was quite a learning curve for, for pro tools. But Mm -hmm. after a couple weeks, I saw the similarities between logic and pro tools and could, could essentially just use what I knew about recording and software and go from there. And so I, I stayed working for him pretty much full-time, like one would have a full-time job, Mm -hmm. and working in his home studio. And that uh, would occasionally bring us outside of his home studio to to other studios. And I was like, I don't know, 21, 22. And he he would have hotshot engineers when we would leave, when we go to Ocean Way Mm -hmm. or East West. And he'd have me come because he wanted me to learn how those guys did their thing. Yeah. And, uh, that seems like one a of great, those great school for you. Yeah. At that time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Daryl Thorpe was one of them, mm-hmm. um, who I spent a lot of time, uh, behind his shoulder looking, oh, what is he doing? Yeah. And asking him questions. And he was, he, he was, and still is, uh, uh, a very knowledgeable and helpful person to me. Um, and another one was a guy named Dean Nelson who lives up in Canada now. Mm -hmm. And he, he used to work at, um, at Ocean Way. He worked with Jack Joseph Puig Mm -hmm. and he was working for Beck when I first started. Um, and he, he was, he kind of was in there until Beck could find somebody to work for him on a more permanent basis. And so, so yeah, Dean helped me and, taught me a whole a whole bunch of stuff i had never uh i had never strictly recorded on a multi-track tape machine Mm -hmm. uh i had done multi-track stuff but it was very minimal but we we cut a whole we we cut a whole record on a on a tape machine right um for uh thurston moore the uh one of the members of sonic youth Mm, we did that we did that without pro tools Hmm. Until until the very end when we did a couple overdubs, yeah, but it was, yeah. and that it was, was cool. something that that Beck produced essentially. Yeah, Beck okay, produced cool. it. Gotta check and that out. It was, <laughs> it, yeah, it was all done at, at done at his home studio at right. the time, and so yeah, and eventually Dean Dean took off and 
um, it was, it was by that time I felt super comfortable with all the gear and the equipment yeah. and the programs and, um, yeah. Yeah. So fantastic. I stayed, I stayed, I stayed working with him for a number of years and, uh, through that got to work on those albums. Yeah. And I think you mentioned to yeah. me, um, during the interview that we did that one of the most memorable experiences was when you, I think were at ocean way for the first time for a session. You want to talk about that a little bit? What, what that was like, like what was so special about that? Yeah. I'm trying to remember which time that was when the first time, when it, when the first time we went was, I don't remember the exact yeah. first time because we went th we went there a number of times, but I feel like every time I go in there, it kind of has that same allure. Yeah, uh, it's a huge studio. There are there are two huge rooms there. I'm talking like gymnasium mm -hmm. size rooms, you know. And you see, you go in, and you see pictures on the walls of Frank Sinatra and all these all these cl classic records that were yeah. that were that were done there. Yeah. And you realize, wow, 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 this place has some history. And um, the live rooms still look like they did back mm -hmm. in those in the pictures. Yeah. And you walk in and you can kind of hear, you almost hear nothing. But then when you start talking or you hear instruments play, you hear the sound of the room. And it yeah. doesn't... It doesn't sound like any other type of room. It doesn't sound like a gym, thank God, um, <laughs> or a racquetball court or anything like that. Um, somehow they were designed so that they sounded big, but you don't have this these awful reverb reflections yeah. that you would in in a school gym. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and you and you mentioned to me that what was so amazing about that session was that how there were these all these different players and it was all happening at that moment and uh, you know you oh were, yeah and you were in the control yeah, yeah. room witnessing that and um yeah i thought that was a, yeah, that was a was, fascinating story i don't remember what session um i was referring to then mm -hmm. but we went in there to record something at some point and i remember there was a time when there was about there was a guy playing upright bass there was a guitar player electric guitar there was an acoustic guitar Then the drums were in the booth. And then there was a, uh, a guy with a keyboard station with like four different keyboards. And I want to say there was a, maybe even a percussionist. Mm -hmm. So there was a handful of guys and they were all of them were in that big room. Yeah. Except for the drums were in this smaller booth. Mm -hmm. And the guitar amps were in the larger kind of, I wouldn't even call it an ISO because it's such a huge room, but it's <laughs> off to the right in, in Studio B. And uh, yeah, yeah you just you look in and everyone's playing and you're hearing what sounds like a record or yeah. you know yeah. a song yeah yeah and is is that kind of what inspired you or what what sort of sparked your passion or your love for um these kind of live band tracking situations with multiple people in in one room essentially where it's all happening at that moment probably partly um i do i do come from playing music before recording music you know mm -hmm. I played music when I was young uh, and that's probably half of it just seeing live shows too yeah yeah because when you're recording you're you're having your own live show your, your private live show <laughs> and you're and you're and you're part of it you know you're like the live sound guy but you're recording it all yeah and so it's partly that Ex those experiences of being in studios and or at least my early experiences mm -hmm. of being in studios and recording people a number of people and then also seeing shows and also playing right. with bands um playing music is fun you're a musician right yeah 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 so i mean that's where it all starts yeah for some for some audio engineers right you know i know a lot of audio engineers who and producers who played music long mm -hmm. before they recorded music, you know? Yeah, and I mean, I think even if you if you don't play yourself, just the, you know, we're all music lovers and, and yeah. the listening experience and then being in that room, you know, where basically, I mean, even if it's not like the entire record, because maybe there are a couple of overdubs, but if it's like, even you know, even if it's just a basic 
tracking session of like you know the core members of a band i i always find that to be the most kind of special days where you're you're capturing you know most of the record right there and then and uh yeah it's it's challenging but it's also because you have all these different dynamics and but it's also a lot of fun and and very gratifying when you get that result you play it back with all the guys and girls in the room and uh you 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 get to get to enjoy that so um yeah uh, we I want to talk a little bit about like how you use the L22 in those situations um, because there, sure and you've already mentioned to me a couple of scenarios where the the microphone and and what it does beyond the modeling actually is really helpful but maybe let's um, jump in on a couple of questions that came in here before we do that um, so we can just do a quick. Uh, how does Dave Pensado call it? Batter's box. <laughs> just, oh, I don't know. So uh, this one's coming in from Mr. Frank Dam Sachs. I'm curious. Uh, I'm curious to know what would be your mic emulation of choice for saxophone. I have the Townsend that I love. Thank you. And I personally use the 67 quite a lot. Oh, cool. Well, it depends on the saxophone. Um, if it if it's like a darker um, like a, a darker sax that's lost all of its lacquer <laughs> and and it's kind of a, a I guess a darker sax, I'd probably yeah. I'd probably use I don't know, I'd probably use a U forty seven on it. Mm-hmm. Um and if but if it were like a newer bright bright tenor or alto, uh probably go with one of the ribbon mics. Mm-hmm. Probably the the one of the RCA or the 77 so, yeah 77 they're not called DX. rc they're not called rca <laughs> they're, the they're based on rcas yeah <laughs> yes so that or maybe the coals yeah i don't particular i don't particularly like capturing the very high end of a of a saxophone um i like them to be a little rolled off i like the kind of boom, boom, boom sound mm. of a of a sax yeah um but yeah i've never tried the 67 uh, model on a sax, uh, or an actual 67 on a sax. Yeah. We, just a, just a 47. Cool. Yeah. We, um, we, we do actually have a, a jazz performance video with a, with a duo. Um, so piano mm. and tenor sax in that case. And, um, that was recorded with sphere and, um, that was, that's, that's on our YouTube channel as well. Um, and, uh, I don't quite remember, there's also a blog post about that. I actually don't quite remember off the top of my head what I used on, on that one. Um, I mean, I also, I do like, like original 67s. I've, I've used those as well. So, um, but like you're saying, it's, I mean, it totally depends on, on the, the, uh, the instrument, but I, I mean, I, I would say like between a 47 and a 67. Um, and I, I, what I found too, is that there's like wild, differences between the 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 artists too like what their expectation is like i i've been working with this one tenor player who um like he really doesn't like the the sort of breathy spitty part that Uh i think sometimes can be really cool to hear but he just doesn't like it and so you know obviously it's always worth checking with that with the artist like what they actually prefer and what kind of sound aesthetic they're going for and that kind of thing right yeah, and I think too with with horns, uh, you can have one player play this, play a sax, and another player play the same sax, and it's going to sound different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably more different than the mic model would be. You know, mm-hmm. you change your mouthpiece on your horn, yeah, and your sound it's going to be different, much brighter. Yeah. You know, so, but I think yeah, larger diaphragm, you know, mics sound good on those on the bigger horns. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I definitely would agree with that. And, and um, there's a follow-up question here from, or a comment, uh, again, from, from Mr. Frank. I find the 67 to be darker and rounder than the 47. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely true, um, especially with the LD67 that's in the Sphere uh, core collection. It's a pretty dark-sounding 67. And, yeah, you know, it's I, f- I find that to be really useful. Now, the thing is, with all of these vintage mics, um, is that they they're they're different like they you know you have 147 or 67 and then you have another one and they're going to sound different because they're you know 40 to 60 years old and they're they've aged differently and uh so and maybe production tolerances were pretty 
pretty much all over the map anyway. So, um, you know, this 67 that we have in Sphere is a pretty dark one. Um, but then there's also the 67 NOS, which is, is based on a 1990s new old stock reissue. And uh, that one's much brighter and, and maybe sounds more like what a, a current production 67 would sound like. Um, Cassidy, mm. you're, if I remember correctly, sort of your first re really good mic was a, an original U47, which... I'm well, yeah, pretty I guess jealous you of. <laughs> well, it wasn't it wasn't mine. It wasn't mine. Um, I had previously owned, you know, like Audix mics mm -hmm. and Blue mics, but I the first mic I really got to spend a lot of time with were Bex mics because yeah. he had some great mics, yeah. and so using the the U forty sevens he had on a daily basis on acoustic guitars and vocals mm -hmm. and drum overhead. Um, yeah, I got really used to how those were. And I also got really used to how to get the best out of them, I guess, you know, how, how far away do you sing from one with this particular singer? Yeah. Um, other people would come over that he was producing and they'd sing on the same mic and we'd have to figure out how to get the best sound out of that mm -hmm. person on that mic. And so, yeah, 47 was the first like classic vintage mic, condenser mic, yeah. or tube condenser mic that I had daily access to. Right, yeah. And I, lo I love those. Yeah. You know, yeah. And I guess that's how you eventually found the L22 too, right? I mean, we have this in the video that you were kind of looking for a clone mic, and then that's, yeah. how, that's how you ended up with the L22. And, yeah. um, and so today this, you know, your, the L22 is like your, in many ways, your go-to workhorse mic and, uh, you know, going through your session, the spell of love session, there are a lot of 47s in there that you've, that you've selected. So it seems like you're, you're very happy with the way this, the 47 sounds in, in our collection. Yeah, I am. And there's also the Bill Putnam collection. Yeah. 47 and uh that one's great too yeah you know yeah that's yeah. The, that's the one with the uh with the m7 uh capsule actually uh that's a cool one too for sure um let's see there are a couple of questions here um what was this one yeah from um this one's interesting because it, talk, it gets us into talking about the workflow a little bit so this is from from Randall Nielsen. Um, would love to hear about your experience and preference tracking through Sphere with UAD versus hardware preamps. Uh, for simplicity alone, I've almost entirely tracked through my Apollo and the uh, UA. So it's interesting because you're actually not an Apollo user. Um, you want right. to describe your workflow real quick? Yeah. So I don't. I don't. I do have a UAD. I do have UAD plugins. Right. But I don't. Run, yeah. I, yeah, I don't yeah. run them off of the Apollo, so right. I don't have the UAD Apollo mic pre's. Mm -hmm. I have a number of other mic pre's that I use with the mic, and then I use the version of the plugin that runs in Pro Tools without any delay. Yeah, and that's that's my go-to for when I'm recording and mixing what I've recorded. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're you're using the the AAX DSP plugin with the with the Pro Tools uh, Ultimate um, most of the time. Um, yeah. And in terms of preamps, um, you have this really interesting Yamaha console behind you. Yeah. Um, but then you also yeah. have a bunch of outboard um, preamps. And and how do how do you find like how what is it like working with those different preamps and uh, how how would you how would you describe that? What's that workflow like? Well, there's 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 not a huge difference in in recording with the sphere with the different mic frees I have. Mm -hmm. So unless unless I'm recording something that's pretty loud, like a drum kit, yeah. I don't notice a, a huge difference. Nothing that makes me decide, oh, I need to use these mic frees for this mic over these ones. Um, but yeah, my my console has three different sounding mic frees in it. Even there's 16 mic pre's, but there's three different sounding ones, <laughs> and uh, I'm not that I'm not nitpicky enough to go, oh, I need to use channel four and you know five and six for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think any any mic pre, whether it's the UAD Unison ones, right, or something that's 
on the on the cheap on the cheaper end of the spectrum will be completely fine. You just don't want you just don't want mic trees that uh, when you turn them up you just hear more hiss, you know. Yeah. yeah. You don't want that. Sh- right. You don't and, want to hear that. And of course, with Sphere because it's a two channel, um, a two channel microphone, you also want the same. Uh, you know, same kind of preamp on both of those channels. And, right. And of course, the thing is that, um, you know, we're the one assumption that we have to make, and we've been we've been talking about this quite a bit. The one assumption that we have to make when you're tracking with the microphone is that you apply the same amount of gear, uh, of, <laughs> the same amount of gain on both and, yeah. on both channels. Um, so, uh, you know, th- that works with either, you know, uh, an Apollo interface where you can link the channels, but it also works with um, any kind of other preamp, really. Um, it's just a matter of um, having to calibrate the front and the back when you're using, you know, preamps that have continuous gain and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, you, I, I've seen that you have a, a couple of Neve preamps as well. Of course, there it's pretty easy because you can use the step gain to, to change the range and that kind of thing. So it's definitely yeah. doable with any kind of preamp. Yeah, Yeah. totally. And you know, I have even if you buy two of the same mic pre and you put them to the same level mm-hmm. and you match them, they might still be a little different. And I haven't noticed any sort of negative, hmm. mm-hmm. negative. Uh, I don't know what the right word is. Negative returns uh, effects or on uh, yeah, side yeah, effects, negative yeah. side effects of not having them exactly right. perfect. Yeah. But you can flip the in the back of the mic. There's that cow yeah. switch. Yeah. You switch that, and whatever. If you're having a singer, just tell them, "Hey, sing for me a, yeah. a sentence or two. And then you just match the two mic pre's, and you go back in and you flip exactly. it. Or you, if yeah. you're comfortable telling the person, "Hey, can you flip that switch on the back yeah. of the mic to where it says on?" Yeah. You know. Yeah. And then you're done. It yeah. takes like ten seconds. So. Yeah. Um, by the way, quick tip, I don't know, Cassie, if you do this, but I do this, uh, I, I try to do this, um, every time when I work with continuous gain, uh, preamps, and this is a good tip for everybody out there who wants to use, you know, either an interface that only has like these continuous gain pots or external preamps, like a API 512 or a console. Um, you know, when you're doing the calibration, just record a little bit of that audio where you have, you know, the same signal on both channels, because that way you have it sort of frozen and and in your session if you ever by accident you know throw the uh, the the sphere plugin out of the session and you lose that calibrated offset you can always come back to that recording and just run it again um so that's just oh. kind of a, a neat little trick that i'm trying to incorporate whenever i do that kind of stuff that's smart so, yeah yeah um just to come back real quick because there was that question right in the beginning um the the Joel um, video that you did last year that we ran on the on the countdown in the beginning. What mic model uh-huh. was that? Do you remember? On his trumpet. On his trumpet. Oh wow. I think I had used. I think when we were recording, I used something really weird and maybe not great, <laughs> because they were in there with, you know, he was in there with a drummer who hit pretty hard. Yeah. So. I wanted to get something that was very directional on his trumpet. Right. And then later I think I I think I may have switched it. I may have been using a Coles mm-hmm. or a, or the RCA. I'd have to open that session up. Yeah. To check so it for out. The, for those who don't know that's the RB4038 model or um the RB770X and there's two versions the Umber and uh and the uh Gosh, what's the other one called? I'm blanking on the other one. Satin. Uh, the satin, yes. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I actually think I used the umber in in yeah, that's the looking darker at one. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I used that on. But Joel doesn't have a very bright, like bright tone on it in his trumpet. He's not mm-hmm. like a wee, you know. Yeah. So he's got a nice rounded tone, and uh, with that kind of mic, it just it kind of complements it well. Yeah. 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 Um, maybe we should just play uh, just a little bit of that video real quick, um, just to just to refresh everybody's memory of what that session looked like and what the room looked like, and um, and then we I want to talk a little bit about how you track in your space because it's just like what uh, thirty by eighteen feet no, or no or not e- not even okay not even I think it's like twenty feet deep by 
maybe 18 feet right. wide. Yeah. So you, and, you and, and you track bands up to like six people in there. So let's, I'm going to roll yeah. that video real quick and then we, we'll talk about it um, just for, just for a couple of minutes. Yeah, just so far. Um, yeah, so, you know, you use the L22 on the trumpet. Of course, there's lots of stuff going on there with, um, you know, drums in the same place um, and, and all that. And so how do you find, does the L22 help you, um, you know, work with that space and, and reduce, obviously bleed is like the number one issue in, in these scenarios. I mean, we know plenty of amazing records that were done in small spaces, you know, just to, just to name Motown, for example, for instance. Um, yeah. but, um, yeah. How do you work with the L22 in that kind of situation where you have a lot of people in one small ish space? Yeah. Well, for one, I think it does help not having a huge space. Mm -hmm. Um, because if say the room were 60 feet and I had the drummer across the room and the trumpet player on the other side. Yeah the drums you would get into the trumpet mic would be so much more delayed mm -hmm. than they are in here. Right now, the trumpet mic, when you record the trumpet player at the same time as the drummer, the amount of drums I'm getting in are a lot lower level than the trumpet that I'm getting when right. he's playing. So when he's not playing, I'll slowly duck. When I've mixed something, I'll slowly duck that. And when he plays, I'll open it almost yeah. like, like it's like a gate opening. Um, but when the drums do come through in the mic, it just adds a little room, I yeah. guess, but you don't hear that because there's trumpet. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of masks the drum bleed. But if the trumpet player were much further away, you'd hear like, yeah, yeah, you'd hear it. You'd hear a delay. Mm -hmm. Um, so it helps having this size of a room for that kind of stuff. And then with that tune, I remember picking Picking a mic that both sounded, picking a mic model that sounded good for his trumpet, but that also didn't have a ton of cymbals in him, mm -hmm. a ton of drum cymbals. That's always the issue, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and if it if it were my if it were up to me, I'd have huge like partitions in there, right? And right. with windows and stuff, I just don't have those. Yeah, and I'd put those in front of the, you know, the trumpet. Um, luckily for that, there weren't other amps in the room. So the keys went direct and the bass went direct. So it was just drums and trumpet mm -hmm. making noise in that room. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've had other sessions with piano and drums. Yeah. And um, the sphere has this ability to, you know, you turn the mic sideways and you're basically recording that way and that way. But mm -hmm. then within the plugin, you can adjust those so that they go like that. That's what it sounds like they're doing to me. <laughs> sounds like they're going like this. Well, I'm off, I'm out of frame, but it sounds like they're they're going right and left. But then you can switch them to kind of do that more like how our ears hmm. went like this. Mm -hmm. You know, I push my ears out or something. Mm -hmm. So it seems to it seems to cut out bleed when you do that a bit. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
you also sometimes like I think you when we talked back in January, you mentioned this one example where you were when you record like upright bass and then working with the or with singers, like working with the proximity effect um, in, in that way a little bit as well. Right. Um, right. Right. I mean, so, this, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I, I know a couple people that are listening might not know what that is. I'll just explain it. Yeah. Uh, certain certain microphones, the closer you get, you get more bass. You get more low low end, mm -hmm. um, and others don't. And so, you can be singing. You know, I don't know how if I'm on yeah. frame. You could be singing <laughs> this far away from a mic, and it sounds really good. And you get this close, and it's a lot bassier. Yeah. Um, but maybe you get more detail in the voice. You know, so sometimes pe some people cut the low end. And with this mic, you can adjust quite a bit of how close the person sounds, it, uh, how close it sounds like the person was. So if for some reason you're getting a better sound half, half a foot away from what you're recording than too close, but yet you want a little more bass, you want a little more low end, you can, uh, you can EQ in that proximity effect without actually getting closer so yeah. for instance if you're recording a bass and you're at a certain distance that you really like the sound of it because you're not getting too much finger mm -hmm. finger plucky noises and you're not getting that scratchy finger calloused finger going over the string <laughs> at the distance but you're not how you're not getting enough low end from the bass you can keep the mic there and adjust the proximity so it sounds like you're closer yeah um yeah. really cool yeah. and you can also automate that so if a singer is singing and they they go, ah, and they back up, you know, <laughs> you, you can, you can, if you wanted to, you could automate with, within Pro Tools or Logic, you could automate them getting the proximity effect not right. changing when they move their head back. Yeah. And especially uh, I've if never you're... done that, but I know it would, I have never done that, but I know it would probably work really well. Yeah, it totally would. And, um, and, you know, this is of course a great way to, um, when you're doing a comp and the singer has been, you know, moving in and out of the mic on different takes, um, yeah. then, uh, you know, you can use the, the proximity control, uh, and automate it to match these different, you know, takes to one comp uh, without having to, Definitely. you know, use multiband compression or, or a dynamic EQ or whatever. Um, yeah. Especially when you've got, when you're working on something and the vocals were done over a couple different days or weeks, mm -hmm. you generally hear a difference. You're like, oh, damn. This, you're trying to comp in this, these, cu these couple phrases of, of vocals and they sound different, but you use the same mic. Right. Must have been where they were, you know, where they were located. Yeah. Maybe, maybe they were a couple inches further, further yeah. away or closer. And so you yeah. can adjust that. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Cool. Uh, lots of stuff going on here in the chat. So, um, Let's see. Not a whole lot about the Spell of Love session so far. So uh, for those of you folks out there who have watched the uh, the Spell of Love walkthrough video with Cassidy that we released um, a couple of days ago, um, he you know he he and his brother uh, Jason, uh, who's also on the on the chat right now, which is awesome, um, they uh, tracked a, a song uh, of Jason's basically almost exclusively with the L22. And so that's up on YouTube, um, and I have that session up as well. If um, anybody has a question, a specific question about that session or about some something that was tracked in that session, um, electric guitar, uh, horns, vocals, drums, uh, definitely let us know because then we can just jump right into that session and, and show something there. Um, <laughs> so um, let's see. There's a couple of things here. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, but this this comes back a little bit to sort of your approach to to tracking, whether it's yourself or bands, like between you know committing to like, do you typically know what microphone you want to go for, um, or um, do you do you just go for something that feels good in the moment and then change it later? Well. I guess typically, yeah, you, I have an idea of what I think would work on somebody's voice or on an instrument, and I'll just go for it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and then later, change it if I need to. Mm -hmm. You know? Just cool. just yeah. like just like if you had a, a number of mics, you would 
pick one to record that guitar amp, Mm -hmm. you know, and then, then you're stuck with it. Right. And you, and it, it, for the most part, it would probably work fine, but it's fun. It's actually a lot of fun to go, Oh, I wonder what, what this one would sound like, you know, and switch, switch them around. And then most of the time you come back to what you, what you picked in the first place. But yeah, 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 I, I go with my instinct of what, what would I use on this on this source, you mm-hmm. know, but of course, and you, you mentioned this in the in the video um, that, of course, sometimes you don't really know what you want because right. you're just in the process of building the track. And then it's really cool to go in and, you know, pick a different pick a different microphone model um, and, and, and that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. It, like it, it, it all it all depends so much on the context. And sometimes you don't really know where a track is going. Um, exactly is that something so yeah yeah you, context, you context is context is everything like that previous question about uh what mic on a saxophone yeah context is everything if you're recording like a uh like a rock tune it's gonna have a different sound than like a if you're trying right. to do like a 60s jazz type thing or 50s jazz sounding mm-hmm. thing you know yeah um great so um, got to bring this question in because it's a it's a perfect segue. So this actually came in from from Caden's kid from your brother. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh, can you talk about your recent uh, film score project and uh, uh, recording um, uh, and, and uses of the mic on that on that project? So um, sure. obviously we can't talk a lot about well we can't be speci- specific about um, the project, but I thought it was really interesting because I didn't know that you also were doing film scoring and. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not scoring it. I didn't, I, right, I'm not okay. a film. I don't yeah. do film scoring, but I record music that yeah. is for a film score. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, just two days ago, finished up, uh, working for two weeks, recording a film score mm-hmm. and, um, mostly I would say the, uh, well, we have, we have a lot of piano on that and mm-hmm. that was all done with the sphere mic, um, and I think I used the 49 on a mm-hmm. lot of it. LD49s, Fun- yeah. LD49. Oh, funny enough, a lot of the piano we ended up running through a, a tape echo. Huh. And, a, and cool. using that specifically. Yeah. A, a tape echo that um, the person I was recording with had brought that's been modified. So there's only a tape output. So you don't, if you turn mm-hmm. the repeats down, you don't actually get any echo. Right. If you want, you just yeah. get a kind of like a Mellotron piano. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's like a tape version of the piano, but the tape kind of warps yeah, because it's, a, it's, it's an echo and not like a mastering great yeah. tape machine. Yeah, it's got like a, a motor from Radio Shack in it, you know. <laughs> and is it is it mono? Or is it stereo? <laughs> it's mono. Right. Yeah, okay. we did we did a couple things where we sent the left side and the right side through the tape echo separately, which right. sounded really weird and yeah. cool, but. Um, but I recorded the piano with the mic and there, there is a, there is a lot. Once the film comes out, I'll talk about it. Sure. Yeah. There's a, we'll there just is, get you on yeah, another there, Q&A. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of piano on it and, uh, no problems. It sounded great. Yeah. And yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. you know, when I, when I, when I, um, interviewed you, I thought it was really interesting how often, you end up using the L22 in in stereo rather than just as a mono mic. Um, yeah. Especially when it comes to tracking percussion and tracking yourself playing percussion. Um, why why do you find the, the stereo mode so useful? I find it useful for a couple of reasons. One, I don't have to get that annoying stereo adapter bar out for any of the <laughs> pairs of mics yeah. I have. Yeah. Two, uh, I don't have other than, uh, I won't mention that. I, I don't have any very good large diaphragm, uh, perfectly matched pair. And then, well, I do, but I don't want to have to set them up and worry about, are these, are these set up correctly for stereo yeah, yeah. and what kind of, and what kind of stereo mode should these be in should i do them like this or should i you know there are a bazillion choices right there yeah Yeah, and there's such big mics that it's hard to get them so 
using this mic is real quick because it's one stereo. Mic. Yeah. <laughs> it's one mic. I don't have to worry about where they're placed. Yeah. And and then also because it's you know, it's this wide, um, you can do stuff on either side of it. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you have two large diaphragm mics and it's in stereo and you just butt them up to each other, there may be some weird issues with phase. Right. Um, so, yeah, I generally use this mic in stereo all the time because I have quite a number of mics mm-hmm. that I can use just for mono stuff. And since I try to like keep everything set up all the time here, um, when we're jumping from one thing to the next, other than for this song that I did with uh, with my brother, yeah. The Spell of Love, um, I leave mics on everything so that I can, mm-hmm. we can just jump from one thing to the next or record two or three things at a time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, what I, what I thought was really interesting um, when you, like you how you were describing, in the Spell of Love video, how you were describing how you kind of build... So you, you always have you have the L twenty two set up in the room and you just oh the percussion you, yeah the percussion stuff and you just go yeah. go to your crate and grab different things and from what I understand you're playing a lot with like where you are in respect to the mic when you record in yeah. stereo like that and you kind of yeah it's almost like you're doing this kind of acoustic panning if you will where yeah um, that's what it is yeah can it's you just a, describe that a little yeah, bit yeah I, I should probably also better make, than I can <laughs> I want to make I want to make a track at some point for you that's just percussion only using the mic because yes. this is a really yes, this is a really <laughs> this is a really cool thing but basically yeah I mean you can start off with a, a tune that needs and say say that say the tune you're like this tune needs quite a bit of percussion to mm-hmm. make it come alive you know and so, depending on your choices and creativity, you could start with something, you know, in the middle of the mic yeah. or in the middle of your stereo field, yeah. like maybe a uh, a shaker, a mono shaker, mm-hmm. and record that. And then you start from. I like starting from the middle just because it kind of gives you an an-, an anchor point, right? Of yeah. like, okay, here's here's my center thing, and and it's in this frequency range. And then from there, you you can slowly or d- quickly, depending on how good you are at percussion, build out from the center to the right mm-hmm. physically. So you could you could do a shaker in the middle, right? And then you could have two other little like maybe like castanets or something, mm-hmm. and you could put them just a little further away from the sides of the mic. Mm-hmm. And then you could do some sort of rain stick new age thing out here or these <laughs> weird that we see in the video these weird what are those like these oh those are from something i found off a tree actually <laughs> they fell off a tree they're, they're they sound like shakers yeah yeah i mean they sound like i don't know this they, they're like a shaker but they're very they're a lot more gritty yeah is that um, in the, is that in the track did that end up being in the track do you remember uh, yeah i think they are in the track should i pull that up real quick let's see yeah maybe they are Let's have a quick listen here, since we have okay. that have that set up anyway. So here's the Pro Tools session. And I think they might I think they might be perk two. Right. Let's have a look. Oh yeah, yeah. I yeah. Def- I definitely nixed a few things. Right. So this is yeah. So uh, Cassie, this is coming in through audio movers if you wanna have a listen. Sure. I'm just gonna gonna play this part real quick. Ah, there's a, still the chamber. Is that them? Oh no, those are those those are some other thing. Ah, okay, then I don't think it's in yeah. that session. I may have I may have ended up getting rid of some stuff. Yeah, yeah. But this one's interesting nonetheless because this one uh so you know this was recorded with the um with the stereo plugin uh with the mic in in 180 mode and uh interesting to see that you that you like to use the the 421s for that um, yeah and um let me just make sure why am i not i only have the edit vin- window up uh, that's the sphere plugin those are there there we go there we go um yeah, and uh, and just really interesting to, I mean, even this, 
because there's like these left and right thingies going on because you have them in both hands and then uh yeah and then yeah and 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 then of course i have the width control um where i can basically control how how wide uh the image is going to be <laughs> and you can always bring yeah. it down to mono because it's perfectly mono compatible which is nice right and uh and yeah you can just kind of go to town with that so I thought that was really interesting. Have you ever, just out of my own curiosity, have you ever, um, have you ever tried like just then going over to one side in your room when you wanted to have something only on oh, yeah. one side rather than using your pan pots for for instance? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I remember. Cool. I remember doing something with with a uh, big like I set up a bunch of floor toms mm -hmm. and. Um, I was I was doing something that was like do 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 right, but I couldn't get I couldn't get over to the other side quick enough without <laughs> without making noise on yeah. the floor, so um, I just did do 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 do, and then on another track I did do 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 on the other side. Right. Yeah. So um, yeah, it, the high part started way on the left. Yeah. And then the low part was on the right, and I didn't have to move a mic, or do yeah, panning. and you already had sort of the track in a space rather than having to use a plugin to kind of recreate all that. So I think, yeah, yeah, that's it's really cool to think about it that way, and then like, you know, work with depth and your position in the room, and then on top of that, use all the different tools that we have in in the Sphere plugin to, uh, you know, to give you a little bit more flexibility because sometimes, you know, you might feel like, well, I don't want to be locked into that particular spatial positioning and that kind of thing and and with a sphere plugin of course you can always bring it down back to mono uh you can make it super wide and and, and that kind of thing so true um and you know this this kind of ties into this question that came in here from from humans to hydra um kind of ties into this whole aspect of of um creativity and and being you know recording yourself because you do that a lot so the, the question is what advice would you give to new producers who have a home studio and they're producing themselves, do you think you can have enough objectivity as a self-producer? Um, now you're in oh, that position question. a lot. So how do you how do you deal with that? Well, I'm guessing that when he says self-producer, I'm guessing he or she uh, is referring to they're making music themselves and they're producing it. I guess. Yeah, I like would they're think so. a songwriter. Yeah. Uh, I can't really answer that. Mm. Um, if, cause some people can have a total objectivity, uh, on their own music and some people might not, but, yeah. um, I think it's important to have, uh, friends or colleagues that you like their taste. Cause that's mm. all objectivity is when it comes to art and music, mm -hmm. it's just taste. Um, so have, having those people chime in on your music and if they like music, you like, and you trust them and you maybe like music they make themselves and they produce, mm -hmm. have them check out your music and tell them, have them tell you what they think. Right. Um, but the first part, what advice would you give producers who have a home studio and are practicing themselves? Pro producing themselves. Yeah. Oh, producing. Sorry. I'm reading yeah. it off of this little thing. <laughs> um, producing themselves. I would say if they're, I'm not, I'm not sure how much experience different people have, but right. I would say that the more you do, the better you get. Hmm. So fussing over the quality too much can have negative effects because hmm. you don't end up having a product to share with right. your, with your, with people who would like your music. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, getting a, a large quantity of music out there constantly and then while doing that perfecting the quality along the way and reevaluating it in a yeah because yeah. you will your quality will increase as mm -hmm. you continue through mm -hmm. um but some people you know they haven't put their first album out and they're they're so in that i gotta have it sound this way for years and they never get anything out. And I think it would have been better to just put the music out. Yeah. Two years before, you know, <laughs> and, and to have spent that next two years working on something else. Yeah. And the quality will just 
increase yeah. as you produce more music. That's just how it goes. Yeah. When I listen back to stuff that I worked on even four years ago, I'm, oh, yikes. You know? Uh, and yeah, that'll always, it'll always be the case where things just keep getting better uh, as time goes on. Yeah. Both, both, yeah. both like, the, both like you know m- my methods and practices and the tools i have available to mm-hmm. me you know cool yeah yeah it's awesome um thank you for that um yeah. actually this one this one ties into that it just came in from from jim Cantor. um how do you know when it's time to take a break and walk away for a while instead of plowing on and doing things you'll have to undo later um, ah. maybe you can I wonder I, I personally wonder if this question somehow ties into your hobby and passion for non-audio things <laughs> yeah good question yeah definitely I think that music music and music production and mixing and audio engineering and songwriting for the most part are fun mm-hmm. you know they should be enjoyable um it's not that I'm saying that there aren't going to be times when things are harder, Mm -hmm. but if you really get stuck in something, I would say, and you're getting frustrated, definitely take a break. That's when you know it's time to take a break and walk away for a while instead of plowing on. Yeah. Cause I've, I've recorded quite a number of people who we get to a point where they're getting frustrated with maybe their arrangement or Mm -hmm. their lyrics and they just push through and they're not happy when, when it's going on. And later we end up redoing it anyway. Yeah. So me being kind of on the outside of the creativity in that essence or in that, in that sense, I've always seen that some, some of that has been a waste of time, I guess, mm. just pushing through when they're, when they're unhappy cause they've got to just, they've got to just finish cause they've got, you know, another hour left to record for the day yeah, and yeah. they just push through sometimes just taking a 15 minute breather and coming back in yeah. can kind of reset the mind. Yeah. So I, when, when you run into these moments, do you go outside and do some gardening? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> like I'll, I'll be, I'll it's be, awesome. I'll be mixing something and I, and go and check it in my car and I'm like, Oh God, there's something up in this part of the song and I'll come back and try to address it. And if I if it just doesn't click right away, I'll just take thirty minutes and go pick some tomatoes or something. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Very Wonderful. therapeutic. Yeah. Yeah. No. For going sure. going outside. Going outside. Yeah. You know. Taking a walk. A, yeah, taking a walk is a big thing. Yeah. yeah. Taking a stroll with your mask on. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do that. That's right. Um, let's see. Uh, this one actually came in um, via Instagram. Um, yesterday uh, from from Louis Misfit. Uh, what are the biggest challenges the L22 has helped you overcome? Time, probably. Huh. Time, in, time in setting up uh, both getting a stereo pair of mics set up correctly right, and dealing with the two cables and going, oh, wait, which <laughs> one was left and right? Oh, I've got to trace it again. That one's left if I'm facing this way or right if I'm facing this way. You know, it starts to get starts to sometimes be annoying and then also um the other part that i'd probably save time in is picking picking a mic especially if i'm recording something new that i haven't really spent a long time or a lot of time recording like some weird instrument that somebody somebody brought Mm -hmm. over i'll just pick that mic yeah pick that and throw it on and then record it and then choose the mic later that sounds best for that instrument yeah you know like if somebody brought like a hurdy gurdy over you know what i mean <laughs> i'd have to do a google on on some things on and find out that. like i would probably go on youtube and find somebody recording their hurdy gurdy and see where do they put the mic you know uh or i'd have the person play and then i'd move my head around and and you know, but like, oh, it kind of sounds best over here. And then right. ask them where do, where have you mic'd this before? Where do you mic it? Yeah. And and then put a mic like the Sphere on, and then pick the model later. 
Yeah, and just go through you it know? real quick and go through 30 different microphone options and yeah, see what sticks. 30, yeah. yeah, it would take one minute to go through 30 different microphone options. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, let's throw a couple of more uh, instruments at you since we're already somewhere in uh, in in the range of obscurity. Um, so, okay. uh, uh, M. Thrasher, speaking of sax, how about flute? Oh, excuse me. Um, what would be your, good question. your go to choice for that? Wow. Well, wow, good question. I don't think that the flute, probably a C12, but not, mm -hmm. I, I think flute is a, interesting instrument because it generally is more important where you record it than what mic i think because hmm. you could have a great mic and put it on a flute and it just sounds like you know it just sounds like somebody <laughs> blowing into a microphone um so i think flute like i like to put the mic right above the person's like head either that yeah, or yeah. kind of in between their head and the the holes the the pads where the holes open. Mm -hmm. um, it's, if it's an open hold flute, I think it probably sounds better over there. Um, right. Like a little, if, you know, a little to the right of their head. If you have two mics, I've got, I've had great results recording flute with two mics, one here and one here, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, I have not recorded flute with the L22. Mm -hmm. I would probably, depending on the, you know, context is everything, but yeah, probably yeah. record it in stereo and put it just to the right of their head. Right. Uh, above. Yeah. Because you don't want to put it straight in front of them because they're blowing right at you. So um, my guess, I would probably, yeah, I'd probably go for a, C a C12. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Uh, one more. Uh, Mark Pixley, best mic for recording banjo without making your ears bleed due to proximity. <laughs> back it well, off there's a, ban there's a banjo in this in this song um was that recorded yeah, with a spear off. yeah there's a banjo it i i wouldn't say it's the greatest uh version of banjo recording um not due to any right, one here. thing in particular not due to the miking or the playing or the instrument right probably all three. Oh, here check this out so do yeah. you remember what you used on that on a spell of love um, well, my brother has a banjo that he hadn't played in like probably 10 years. Um, yeah. And he was like, well, I could put banjo on this. So he put banjo on it. But do you remember think, the mic model? Um, I can say, yeah, and check it right now. <laughs> no, 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 no cheating. No, here it is. Oh. Here it is. Oh, I just the, used the sphere. The sphere diffuse. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Just on cardioid. Well, you know. Sometimes you just go for, for that for for no modeling. Yeah, I will <laughs> say that the the when I first got the mic, uh, a good friend of mine, Travis, uh, was over and we were checking out the different models, and we saw we saw just like the sphere one, and we tried that one out on something, and we were like, damn, just the straight up mic with no modeling sounds wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was I think one of the. I think it's worth it, <laughs> just that. Right. Well, that was one of the top requests from like a lot of the, especially like professional beta testers in the very beginning, like four or five years ago, who uh, you know who checked out the L twenty two. The question was always like, what does the mic sound without the modeling? And so mm. I know that Chris and Eric put like a ton of work into making the microphone itself sound as good as it possibly can without any anything, because there are situations where you just have to do an analog monitoring or you know you can't run the plugin in real time and you don't want to have something you know like with some of the other modeling mics it's always about like well the mic has to be like super flat and stuff like that and no it doesn't have to be flat you just need to know what it is as your reference starting point and make it consistent from one mic to the next and whether it's flat or not doesn't matter to certain limits and so yeah. uh you know for situations where you can't run the plugin you do an analog monitoring and it just needs to be a good sounding mic. And we, we, you know, we felt so good about what the, the, the mic does without the modeling that we, we made these, uh, custom, uh, settings here in sphere linear. Um, of course is a bit more special because it gives you flat response from 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz, but then sphere direct is the microphone itself without any modeling. 
and then diffuse has is basically linear in the in the off-axis diffuse field. Um, mm. So it's it's fun to play with that and see what it does to kind of off-axis sound and, and that kind of thing. But yeah, that cool. interesting interesting question here. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think to answer that guy's question, I would worry more about your mic placement and then on the banjo record. Yeah, and yeah. then record after you've done that. Find this find maybe use the just the linear sphere model. Find the best spot where you like the sound of your banjo and your ears aren't bleeding. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> and your ears aren't bleeding. And then switch through the models after you've recorded and find, oh, wow, I like this, um, I don't know, strangely this shotgun mic sounds the right, best. Right, yeah. You know, or, you know, or, oh, dang, I like this small diaphragm mic on my banjo. Cool. Yeah. Um, that's the beauty of this mic is you don't have to pick one. Mm -hmm. You don't have to. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm not a banjo player, but I, I'm as as always. I'm assuming that there there are there are wild differences between different banjos and strings and playing styles and all of that. So sometimes, you know, we can bend over backwards with with microphones, but if you know, sometimes it's just easier to address address what's happening in front of the mic. Um, yeah, but, yeah, definitely. Yeah, if you're playing with a ton of fingers. And you're slapping the, you know, it's got like a drum head essentially mm -hmm. on it. Yeah. You're slapping that. I'm sure that, that I would mic it differently than if somebody were just gently picking it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Great. There is no, there is no best mic for recording banjo. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure he will find one that, that's best for what he's doing. Yeah. 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 Cool. Um, well, we're, we're already, uh, we've already been going for quite a bit here. Um, and I know you're, you're busy, so I don't want to, uh, tie you up too much and, and, but I want to get through just a couple of questions. Of course, we still have to talk cool. about this announcement. Cassidy, you, you know what I'm talking about already. Um, yeah. so, um, this one's interesting. Well, I can answer them quickly. Yeah. I can yeah, answer them quickly. This one's pretty interesting. Uh, from Sonny. How does the L20... Sonny George. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I know, Sonny. Hey, Sonny. <laughs> How does the L22 help you forget the gear, so to speak, and focus on the music? Then on top of that, when do you find that getting lost in the nerdy gear stuff actually helps creativity? Okay, so the first question, how does LA2, LA, L22 help you forget the gear, so to speak, and focus on the music? Well, for one, I could say everyone has a certain amount of attention. Hmm. If you say everybody has a certain amount of like little pieces of attention, and some of those pieces of attention are on your are on your gear when you are recording and when you're creating. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when you're using this particular mic, you set a mic model and you you don't have your attention on is am I using the right mic? Essentially, mm -hmm. you can just record, and so your attention is off of that and on what you're actually doing, which right. is capturing music. Yeah. And then on top of that, what do you? When do you find that getting lost in the nerdy gear stuff actually helps creativity? Well, I think I think there's a lot of nerdy gear stuff that is creative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, modifying things and uh, like, for instance, this these people I was with uh, the last two weeks who had who did this who wrote this film score. They're very into gear, right? Yeah, They've got all sorts of weird contraptions they've got a guitar that you can push this button and it'll has this wheel that spins on a string um okay. <laughs> and it sounds it sounds like a forever sustaining guitar so like that kind of stuff helps creativity because it's a it's like a new instrument or they have a, a tape echo machine that's been modified so right. that you can go in and out it without any dry signal so i think that that kind of stuff helps creativity because it's gear related and they're you're using gear in a creative way mm -hmm. yeah yeah but it's interesting because like what you're just the, the things that you were describing it seems like that's a lot easier in analog gear versus like digital in the box kind of stuff um at, at, would, would you agree with that yeah i feel like actually having like the tactile sensation of mm -hmm. a knob is always going to be easier and more creative than using a mouse. Right. Um, even when you have a fader that controls your, 
your digital workstation. Mm-hmm. It's never quite the same as a real fader. I don't, I don't know why. Yeah. Um, so having real equipment and real knobs feels more creative. Mm-hmm. Therefore, it is more creative. Yeah. To me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess also, I mean, you have a you have a patch bay. I'm sure you must have run into these situations where you like these happy accidents where you recall, like you set something up and you still have something patched from before. And oh, yeah. I mean, like there are countless examples of this in like audio history of like sounds being created, like iconic sounds being created that way. But I feel like that's something that I, I, I wish there was a way. And like some, some plugins have this where you like hit a random button or something like that, right? Like virtual instruments. I, yeah. I wish there was a way to sort of recreate these happy accidents in digital where... So all of a sudden it's like, ah, oh, this is this is unexpected, but cool, you know. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Sometimes sometimes I'll copy like a an effects send to the wrong channel. Yes. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I, so they, they can happen, right? And a little bit in digital. But yeah. I've definitely had I've definitely had like happy accidents where I don't remember that I had left a compressor patched yeah. in on a mic. Yeah. And I was recording something quiet and then I want to use that mic for something else and so i bring it over and i start recording and the compressor's compressing what a lot more than what one would think you would do but it ended up sounding really cool yeah you know yeah um maybe we should maybe we should ask chris to add a like a surprise me button in the sphere plugin that just pulls up a random (laughs) (laughs) mic model that'd be kind of fun yeah (laughs) random randomize yeah yeah Yeah. (laughs) All right, um, let's have another look here. Um, something that's fast to answer. Uh, well, this one is not fast to answer, but probably a good one nonetheless. Uh, again, from Randall Nielsen. Do you have ah. a different mindset for Sphere? Um, when you want to present an instrument track as mono versus when thinking stereo, or do you record everything and see where it takes you in the plugin? Okay. Um, yeah, I would say when recording vocals is the only time I've noticed that I don't record in stereo or mm-hmm. I don't record in 180 where the mics turn to the side. Yeah. Um, I feel like for things, for things like a guitar amp or a few other things, even if you have the mindset, I want this to be in mono, I haven't found it to sound bad mm-hmm. when putting the mic sideways and recording in stereo, but right. using the, mon- the mono version of the plugin. Mm-hmm. Other than vocals, I think vocals are way more sensitive to the fact that the mic is, the Off two axis. capsules are facing, yeah, yeah facing yeah. that way. I don't, I don't want to record vocals like that yeah. with two diaphragms. I'd rather yeah. do that. Yeah. So, um, if you know for sure you want a mono thing, then record it, in mono. Yeah, <laughs> record in mono. If yeah. you don't care, if you're not, if you're not sure, then record in stereo. Yeah, you know that's well. That's what and I and think. one thing I would say is if if it's in if if you're recording in stereo and it's right in front of the, uh, in front of the mic. So at at the you know you have these two capsules pointing this way, and and you're right in the middle recording something, and then you know obviously the the closer you are. And and the more likely you're gonna have like issues with the fact that you're actually recording off axis, but also enabling off axis correction in in the dual view will actually help you with that a little bit. So the you know when when you engage off axis correction, what happens is you get better off axis response in the these two capsules, and so um, that actually mitigates some of these kind of you know I'm recording at 90 degrees off axis kind of issues. Um, so that's kind of a good good trick, but yeah, I mean, what you're saying makes perfect perfect sense. If you know you're going to be wanting it in, in mono, then just record in mono for sure, um, and that would that would probably apply for for vocals, for instance. By the way, Chris yeah. says, Chris says no on the uh, on the randomize button. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, man. Well, I think we've got a lot of stuff covered. Um, I have a feeling cool. we're going to be doing this again at some point. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd love to get together with you again when we, um, you know, when, when the, the film that you just uh, scored is, is out. 
and um, recorded want, the score. Uh, sorry, the, the score that you recorded <laughs> is out. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, there's just a couple of things I want to I want to mention before we get to our final main announcement. Um, and one is, you know, I posted this already in the comments. Um, our users and fans group, um, very excited that you're on there as well. Um, Jason yeah. Goldberg is on there too. Uh, it's a, it, the link is in the comments right now. Um, so head over there, um, you know, just request membership um, if you're interested in the L22, in, in what we do at Townsend Labs. And also if you just, you know, whether it doesn't matter if you have a mic already, the L22, or if you're just interested and, and want to learn more, um, it's a great place to ask questions. It's a great place to, um, you know, share something that you've recorded with the L22 and get, get some feedback and, uh, and just a, a good place to hang for sure on, on Facebook. Um, and, uh, and then of course, uh, the obvious, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. It actually means a lot to us because, um, it, it means that you, you know, we kind of can tailor our content that we create here and the live streams that we do. Um, to like what you're looking for. So any kind of feedback that you give us and the fact that you sub subscribe to the channel is just a kind of a, a great way to tell us that we're doing something that's valuable to you. So uh, yeah, please please subscribe, hit that notification bell and uh, you'll be the first to know when there's a new, new video coming out. Um, so I'm gonna say without further ado, let's talk about the, the cool announcement that we have to, uh, to mention and, and uh, explain today. So- um, All right. <laughs> so uh, uh, we don't do we don't do giveaways particularly often um, at Townsend Labs. Um, we haven't been doing them particularly often so far. Um, there's only been a, a couple of, of occasions, and um, you know we were kind of in a, in a tricky spot this time because we have so many mi mics on back order that you know we want to be sensitive to that, and we're not going to give mics away to somebody um, when there are other people who have already ordered a mic, which I think is, is understandable. Um, yeah. But we're confident that we're going to be resolving this back order situation very soon. So um, we, we figured now is a good time to do this giveaway. And so, um, yeah, so the, the announcement is that we are doing a giveaway. And it's actually going to be with the multitracks of the Spell of Love session that you and uh, your brother recorded for us. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's super exciting because um, it's going to be uh, your guys' chance to win one of two Sphere L22 microphones that we're going to be giving away. And um, appropriately, we're going to be running this giveaway up until October 31st, which is uh, Halloween. So the song's called Spell of Love. We figured we could do that. Would make sense. Um, and, Spooky. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, how, how do you participate? Of course, is the question. The, so the way you participate is um, we're going to have a dedicated page on our site, and this one will be announced once again and in all detail, probably towards the middle of this upcoming week. But the way it's going to work is, is you go to our website, you download um, the multitracks from uh, the Spell of Love session that, that Cassidy and, uh, and Jason have recorded. And, um, and then you can go to town. You can create um, a, a perfect mix the way you imagine it, um, you can create a, an EDM remix. <laughs> you can create. <laughs> yeah. You can create your spooky <laughs> Halloween version. You can re-record it in your own language. You can do whatever you want to do. Oh yeah. Um, That'd and be cool. And I'm actually really curious about all the stuff that's that's going to come out of this. But it's going to be kind of a, a Halloween creative challenge um, all throughout the month of October. And um, we're not going to be judging all of the entries, but we're just going to. So basically, you just you know send us the um, your finished work. And then share it on social media, and um, from all of the entries in there, um, just randomly we're going to pick those two winners. So there's not going to be any kind of judging in that sense. But you know, if if guess Cassidy, if you're game, I think it would be kind of fun to just maybe just highlight a couple of the ones that we feel like kind of stood out, or do like a yeah. re reaction video. The <laughs> Grammy sure. winning producer re reacts to <laughs> to yeah, to I'd, remixes. I'd love to I'd love to check check them all out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, we'll, we'll yeah. see how many there are and, and how much yeah. there's going to be. But the, so the bottom line is that p winners will be picked randomly. There's not going to be a you know here's the what we think is the best because there's probably not going to be a best. There's going to be a bazillion really great ones. Um, so uh, yeah, that's going to be the giveaway. Like I said, we're going to be officially announcing this sometime during the middle of this upcoming week. And uh, with all the details, so you don't need to take notes now. 
But uh, yeah, you know, on, on behalf of, of Chris and Eric and everybody at Townsend Labs, uh, Cassie, I just want to say thank you for, for doing this with us because I think, you know, the session, there's so much good stuff in there. Um, you know, like I said, banjo, saxophone, trumpets, clarinets, electric guitar, um, lead vocals, backing vocals, percussion, drum overheads, uh, lots of really, really cool stuff. And uh, to have access to these multi-tracks and be able to play with that, that in itself, I think is really, really awesome. And um, I think, I, I hope yeah. that a lot of you folks out there will appreciate that. And so, and then having the ability to get creative with that, get spooky and uh, and potentially win an L22, I think is going to be the the icing on the cake. So, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and it's also a, an opportunity for people who haven't, who haven't used the mic to hear how the mic sounds yeah. with me using it and to mess around with the plugin too. Right. Yeah. On some different, like some different instruments, like a banjo. Yeah. You know, that, that you normally couldn't be, wouldn't be recording because you don't have a banjo player nearby or <laughs> yeah. <laughs> something like that. Yeah, no, for sure. And then of course yeah. all, uh, so the, the way we're going to do this, um, is, um, is we're gonna, just going to make the raw tracks available, and they're all going to be labeled. So there's going to be they're going to be clearly identified as sphere tracks, and some of them are going to be monosphere, and some of them are going to be sphere 180. So um, yeah, being able to play with that and and kind of follow up on everything we've done with um, you know your interview video, and then the spell of love walkthrough, and now the Q and A. This is kind of like the the final piece to the puzzle where you can actually go in and and try it for yourself, which I think is going to be really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. All right. Well, cool. th thanks so much for taking the time. Um, it was, I had a lot of fun. I hope you did too. I hope everybody else I did. did. <laughs> yeah. You're very, you're very welcome. And thank you too. Cool. All right. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. With that being said, I hope everybody has a, has a good week um, and, and a good, a good rest of the day, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, it's pretty late over here in Germany where, where I'm based. <laughs> so i uh, going to wrap this up pretty quickly. We're going to post a replay of this, um, of course, on YouTube with chapters and everything. So you can kind of come back to it and, and revisit it. Um, and uh, yeah, if you haven't done so, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, make sure that you join our users and fans group. And then, oh, bef almost forgot that one. Uh, make sure that you sign up for our newsletter if you haven't done so. Because um, that's actually where uh, we're going to be um, announcing the, um, the giveaway. So make sure you sign up to our newsletter um, so you're the first among the first to know about the giveaway when it actually uh, goes live. And you can get started with that right away. Cool. Um, cool. Anyway, with that being said, Cassidy, thanks again. And uh, yeah, we'll talk soon. All right. Welcome. Okay. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye, everybody.